Welcome folks. We will get started at the top of the hour in a minute. Welcome everybody. We will get started at the top of the hour. Thank you for joining today. All right, let's get started. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Engaging in Policymaking for Food Systems, Waste and Climate, Tips, Strategies, and Best Practices. I'm Brenda Platt, I'm the Director of the Composting for Community Initiative at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And let me just start off by saying that today's webinar is less about specific pieces of legislation and really more about demystifying the process, discussing strategy, learning how your government works, and the importance of being engaged, and what it takes to be persuasive so you can form coalitions and fight opposition and win on some of these issues. I think as we all know, the hallmark of a healthy democracy is an engaged citizenry, so we hope that this webinar will help you become more engaged and um, and effective. So let me just also start by saying a word about the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We just celebrated 50 years last May. Since our inception in 1974, we have been promoting a homegrown economy, if you will. We work in key sectors of the economy, such as waste, energy, retail, uh, broadband, fiber optic networks. We uh, providing community members with research and advocacy advocacy tools has been baked into our DNA from our from the beginning. As one of our co-founders, David Morse, has said, we make the rules and the rules make us, pretty much meaning like, you know, envision and work for the world that you want to live in. So the rules and policies are important. And ILSR has been identifying, developing, and promoting policies at all levels of government, policies in particular that help build healthy, sustainable communities. We push back against uh, pro-bigness pro policies that perpetuate um, inequality and inequity. In retail, to give you an example, we were the first to help cities pass policies limiting the size of grocery stores to help keep out um, Walmart stores in broadband. We are stopping the proliferation of state policies that have been pushed by big telecom companies, policies that would prevent cities from owning their own broadband networks. And in the waste sector, most recently, um, we've been supporting a $2 per ton surcharge on waste disposed in order to fund solutions. And this slide is just showing some of our most recent um, reports and resources on specific policies. So uh, we're gonna put a link to some of these resources in the chat. So take a look at your leisure. In the composting for community initiative, some of our uh, recent policy resources include uh, this template we've developed on a surcharge if you're interested in working on something like that at the state level. We are also uh, released uh, this Healthy Soils and Compost Policy Guide. And uh, earlier this year, we also released an action plan um, on composting and how that inter how it connects with climate protection, a guide for local solutions. So there's model language in there. If you if your town has a local uh, climate action plan or it doesn't, this could be a, a good resource for you. Um, so and our website, we just redid it uh, this this spring. And so we have a lot of these model policy templates there. We work not just on policy, but we do training on composting and we support a network of community composters and a distributed infrastructure for that. But check out our policy, explore that topic on our website. Uh, we have a library and resources. We have uh, 
lots of examples. This is some of the examples and some of the policies that we track, both state and local, soil health, zoning and permitting, organics diversion recovery. We try to focus on model policies, not just all policies that are out there. And if we're missing something that you think we should cover, by all means, let us know. We would love to look into it. Um, ILSR was founded in Washington, D.C., and while we are a national organization, we have always worked in our backyard, which includes Maryland, and we have a long legislative history there. The first bill I worked on was the Maryland Green Act in 2010, which was sponsored at the time by Maryland Senator Jamie Raskin, and um, since then, our statewide composting advocacy has really accelerated. And it, it, that first happened when I went to a neighbor's house who was hosting a meeting with my local district delegate who was running for reelection at the time. And at that meeting, I mentioned the vacuum of pro composting policies and programs in the state. And that led to working with her. And I went, wow, that, that wasn't so hard. Maybe we should all get to know our local elected officials. And I think um, you can check out the link that's in the chat on some of the policy we worked in Maryland, but I think this is a good segue to introducing our panel today, but it includes my current delegate, Lord Charcutian, a member of the um, House of Delegates representing Montgomery County, Maryland. And I continue to, to work with Lord for now many years. And I think, again, this highlights the importance of getting to know your representatives and senators. So joining Lorig and me is Ida Eskamani, who's the Senior Director of Legislative Affairs for the State um, Innovation Exchange. And that is a national group um, uh, uh, doing work with legislators on progressive policies. And then joining us is Nick Lapis, who's the Director of Ad Advocacy for Californians Against Waste. And I'll give a little bit more about each of the panelists and they'll introduce themselves. Uh, the way this webinar is going to work today is we're going to run a few polls in a few minutes or a few seconds. And then um, I'll introduce the panelists again. They'll introduce themselves with some opening remarks. I have some prepared questions for our discussion, the moderated discussion. And then by all means, start. Um, you can uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, the chat is closed, but the Q&A box is open. Don't wait to get your questions in there. It would help if you, uh, if you know you want to address it to one of the panelists to put Nick or Ida or Lorig's name there. And, um, and then uh, we'll get to those. And then if some of you are interested in live captions and translation, there are some options available. So click on the navigation bar at the bottom of your screen. If you're having any difficulties with that, you can put your questions on that in the chat too. I wanna introduce my team today. Today, they're mostly in the background. There's me, I'm the Director of Composting for Community, but I'm joined today with Sophia Jones and Julia Spector who are on focusing on a lot of the policy work we do on the composting team, and they'll be moderating the uh, Q&A box and helping um, uh, figure out uh, some of the questions to share with me to ask. And then Jordan is running kind of all tech and the polls and uh, the registration. So thanks to my team who are in the background. I couldn't do this without you. Love you guys. All right, so let's start with some polls. Uh, the first poll is, where are you participating from, from today? Eastern US, Southern US, Western US, Midwest, or outside the United States? So we just wanna get a sense of who is in the room. And Jordan is running the polls. And when there's enough of you who have participated, she will close the poll and show the results. All right, well, it looks like we have almost half of you from Eastern US. Southern US, Western, Midwest, outside of the US. Well, all of you are welcome. Thank you for joining today. All right, so the next poll um, is what best describes your affiliation? Are you a composter? Do you collect food waste? Are you representing government at any level? Are you an advocate public interest group? Or are you, with a, are you an educator? Are you with a educational institution or other. And the results. 
Okay, one fifth are actually involved in the field of collecting wasted food or recycling it, composting it. Quarter from government, quarter from public interest advocacy groups, and almost 10% from education and another fifth other. So we have a great mix today, terrific. All right, next last poll, I think we have three here. What best describes your policy and or advocacy experience? So do you have lots of experience, some experience, or little or no experience? All right. About a little more than 15 have lots of experience. Hope that's all you government people. Some experience, half of you, but third, little or no experience. All right, that is fantastic. Hopefully we will um, uh, get to address um, at all levels for, depending on your experience, meet, meet some of your needs and questions. All right, this is again is our panel. So we can have our panelists, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and our panelists can, um, turn your videos on and let us get started. So we're going to get started by the first few minutes um, is having each panelist introduce themselves, give a brief description of your experience engaging with stakeholders, interest groups, or elected officials to advance a cause, policy, or issue area. Feel free to focus on the topics that our audience is most interested in, waste, food, resilience, um, composting and the like, and how you work with constituents on policy advancements, how you work with legislators, advocates, or interest groups, etc. So I'm going to start with Lorig. Lorig, welcome. So great to have you here. So great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, my rock star constituent who works with legislators all across the country, but I get the honor of being your legislator. So it's nice to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Brenda and I have had a chance to work on a lot of legislation together. As uh, as she says, it's a, it's a sort of living room, kitchen table kind of a conversation that turns into laws for Maryland. And that is the best kind of laws for Maryland and for the whole country. And so I'm really excited to be having this conversation with everyone today. I will say just briefly about my own path to the legislature, which it turns out to be somewhat less common um, than I had expected when I when I first got myself elected, um, which is I came in really as a community advocate. So I had been doing professional work in restorative justice and conflict resolution, violence prevention work for 20 years. And I had been doing um, community volunteer work for years in the food justice arena. And um, both of those things, both my volunteer work and my professional work had kind of brought me to Annapolis to work on different pieces of legislation. And I spent enough time, Annapolis being our capital, so that's what the, the state legislature, um, I spent enough time there, you know, working with legislators and working on getting bills passed and sort of paying attention to the process that I was like, mm, I think I could do this. Um, this is recorded, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but I thought I could do this probably better than a lot of people here, so maybe I should do this. So, um, you know, hopefully many of you, as you go through your process, will arrive at the same place and, and become legislators yourself. But even if that particular outcome is not the right one for you, part of what I'm really excited to talk about is um, is being part of the process of, of building policy. And so, you know, I like to talk about um, democracy as a participatory sport, uh, that has it's a it's a participatory sport and it's a year round sport so it doesn't have a season we think of of uh, voting as the season of democracy and we pay you know more attention when there's elections going on but it is an ongoing process and that's and that's really the the opportunity that we get to talk about today but specifically what I'm excited about talking about today is um, is is building the relationships and you know like with anything else. Um, in any policy area and any crisis we're facing, it is relationships and community that ultimately is going to save us. And that is true also in how we uh, build our policies themselves. And so I come out of, as I mentioned, the conflict resolution restorative justice world. And so a big piece of what um, my focus as a policymaker in Annapolis is, is really working with 
people who have technical expertise for sure, but also people who are directly affected by the decisions that we're making and really trying to bring together coalitions of folks who are directly affected by the decisions that we're making as well as um, as as folks who who have who have some level of expertise and in, uh, in the technical side of it and and often they're the same people but sometimes they're different sets of people and so we're building the coalitions um, across those those knowledge bases and um, and I think that uh, you know so so as I was saying like one of the surprises to me was um, the just and I don't know why it was a surprise but the amount of um, you know sort of corporate lobbying folks walking the halls of Annapolis with shoes that cost more than I earn in a month. Um, and just the power of, you know, people who can be there all the time tracking and, you know, sneaking in the amendments that, you know, undermine the community compost, you know, um, uh, regulations or, you know, like whatever it is that, that we might be working on. And, and really sort of the only antidote to that is, um, grassroots organizing and participation. And so we'll, I think, have a chance to talk a lot more about that. But if, if there was one takeaway that I would give you, it would be start building your relationship with your state legislature today, like this afternoon. And I, um, I'm often surprised how many people don't know who their state legislators are after I get through feeling offended um, by that fact. I uh, encourage you to find out because I think there's a lot of attention, of course, that's paid to, to national politics and they are very important and we definitely need to win in this next round. Um, but uh, but this but the state is is where a lot of the decision making is actually happening, the stuff that affects folks on a regular basis and certainly in terms of climate and environment and food systems. Um, there's this really the the state decision making is where it's at. And and the good news is it's also way more accessible than you might think. And so if you're not as connected, it's it's worth really thinking about that as a way to, to start to make a real difference. And so start building that relationship now. Start building it when you're not in session. I know some states have year round sessions. We'll probably talk a little bit about that. Maryland is a part time session. It's a it's theoretically a part time legislature. I can tell you I work full time for that part time money. But um but the the you know it's a 90 day session but really i do my work not in session but in the uh in building the the relationships and building building the bills building the legislation itself i do it you know in the 9 months that we're not that, that we're not that we're not in session and so really starting to build those relationships getting to know that person having a cup of coffee with them having a phone call with them um, so that by the time the legislative session comes around, whether that's the person you're working on a bill with, or it's the person that you now have their cell phone to say this bill is coming to the floor, or this really dangerous bill is moving through committee, um, and can you flag it, and, and what do you think that you can do about it? So um, I think we're going to talk a, a lot more in detail about that, but uh, the bottom line is relationships matter, and they matter really in everything, you know, for our health, our community's health, our physical health, and everything else. But they also matter in policy making and and um, and state legislators are way more accessible than you might think. And so let's start building relationships. We want you as our friends. Awesome. And Laura, I forgot to, I mean, not only is Laura a rock star in Maryland, but she's also recognized nationally. The National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, NCL, uh, presented Laura with its Environmental Achievement Award last year. So congratulations on that. All right. So let's move to Nick Lapis, who's the Director of Advocacy for Californians Against Waste, and uh, who's been there, what, 17 plus years? So Nick, I won't steal your thunder. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, good morning or afternoon, whatever time you're, you're listening. Uh, Nick Lapis with Californians Against Waste. We are an environmental advocacy organization, um, been around since the late 70s, started around the same time as ILSR, very similar scope of issues we work on, except we're based in California. Um, I kind of think of us as a California analog to ILSR. Um, so most of what we do is proposing legislation and then building uh, coalitions to get legislation passed. We also do a lot of work on regulatory development um, and then, you know, some research and education as well. Uh, so the Usually, if you've heard of a law coming out of California that has to do with waste reduction, recycling, composting, it's something that our organization probably developed the policy around and campaigned for. Um, 
In California, we have an official title for bill sponsors, and it's a different term in California than everywhere else in the, in the country where the bill sponsor is the organization that proposes the bill. Um, everywhere else, the sponsor is the, the legislator. But in California, the legislator we call the author. Anyway, long-winded way of saying um, most of what we do is, is we sponsor legislation. So uh, everything from plastics to you know individual product policies like the bottle bill, e-waste, tires, mattresses, paint, um, to a lot of work around composting, um, sponsored the states, all the states uh, organic waste laws, and a lot of work around truth and environmental advertising, recyclability claims, compostability claims. Um, just kind of all over the place, but if you know ILSR, then you basically know us. Very, very similar scope. That's that's kind of you to say. Although we're, I will just clarify, we're a five hundred one c three c three organization, so we're a little bit different. Wait, um, and just for the record, we, we have both. We have a c three and a c four. So yeah, we do not have a c four, so we're not exactly alike. Um, but I uh, love that deck. Thank you. Um, so Ida, Ida is the um, Escamani Senior Director of Legislative Affairs for State Innovation Exchange Six. Um, which works closely with legislators, advocacy groups, think tanks, and the like on progressive policy issues. So Ida, welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with so many incredible folks. Um, as was noted, my name is Ida V. Eskamani. I'm Senior Director of Legislative Affairs at State Innovation Exchange, or SIX for short. Uh, SIX turns 10 years old this year, so I feel like a baby compared to some of our amazing speakers here. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we are a multi-issue organization, and we work in all 50 states. We focus on governing. Um, so there's a lot of organizations that help people get elected. We're the organization that when folks are elected, we help support legislators across the country to center people in policymaking. Um, and that is the model of governing that we work to build. It means that those most impacted by your government have a seat at the decision-making table and work in collaboration with elected officials uh, towards advancing justice and centering people in policymaking. Um, we, we have this model because we know that state legislators are historically built by and for special interests, not for people. Um, and legislators who advocate for the public good, like the delegate here, are often isolated, underpaid, understaffed, and also when you're going up against these like corporate goliaths, you're often under attack. You're targeted by some of the largest corporations, not just in the state or in the country, but multinational corporations. Uh, and also at times literal hate groups that are operating in our state capitals. And so uh, we have our allied legislators that are doing what they can, but are also under stress and attack while also everyday people are traditionally left out of the decision making table in state capitals. And those decisions about our lives are made and our money are made behind closed doors where transactional politics reign, right? Um, so at six, we know that another world is possible where state governments are built by and for people. Um, and we do that by building what we call shared power between legislators and community centered grassroots organizations. Um, and so we build that kind of power in state and across the states um, via our on the ground state directors. We have our a Maryland state director who um, does incredible work in the state alongside um, the delegate here. Uh, and we also have program teams that operate in all 50 states. I wanna give a shout out to our ag, agriculture and food systems team um, who does incredible work on a lot of the issues that we'll be talking about uh, broadly today. Um, and one example of sort of how we organize cross state is our agriculture and food systems teams has a cohort of uh, legislators who represent rural communities called CROP, the Cohort for Rural Opportunity and Prosperity. And so this is a cross-state cohort of legislators who are want to advocate for mom and pop farms and for equitable food systems, uh, regenerative farming, uh, and are also often representing rural communities that historically have been left behind by a lot of the progressive infrastructure, right? And so we center uh, and, and build shared power uh, across state lines with legislators and community groups to advance uh, a, a vision of the states that actually centers people. Um, we also have a reproductive rights team, a democracy team, and an economic justice team. Um, so through sort of that um, multi-layer of organizing, we organize in-state and cross-state again towards uh, on all different issue fronts. But our model is effectively centering people and the expertise, lived experience of impacted people 
in governing to also disrupt the sort of status quo power structures in state capitals that uh, center corporate lobbyists and campaign checks and and uh, not the, the the needs of people, right? Um, and so a lot of that cross-state organizing we do is really essential because uh, folks that are facing either the same fights or also trying to advance similar agendas can trade lessons, strategies, best practices. Let's say, for example, in one state, you're trying to advance paid family medical leave and the opposition is saying, oh, well, this won't work in the state. Well, we will bring in legislators and uh, public officials from states that have already implemented it to be able to say like, oh, it does work. Here's how we made it work, right? And so that kind of cross the organizing has been really effective on all sorts of different issue areas. Um, I think like broadly speaking, right, we know that the corporate lobby is incredibly organized and coordinated. Um, and so that peer-to-peer -peer model that I mentioned um, that, that we do at six across state and, and also global borders is essential to build our futures, as well as organizing towards that transformational politics that we dream of, um, not that standard transactionalism that really benefits the elite few. Um, we know that government works. It just doesn't always work for us, right? Uh, there's a narrative that government's inefficient. And as someone who is um, organized in state capitals across the country, we know government's very efficient. It could doll out corporate tax breaks, policies for corporate lobbyists, like government works very well, just not always for people, right? And so at six, we believe in the power of giving those keys to people, giving the keys to the machine to us and the magic that we can build in collaboration with our legislators that are working with us uh, and often come from our communities as well, right? Um, and just a little bit about myself in the sense of like how I got into this work and um, and how I've, I've organized. Um, I always joke my love language is challenging corporate power. Um, my, I'm the daughter of, of working people here in Orlando, Florida, uh, immigrants from Iran who met in America to, to work to build a better life for their kids. I'm a proud Floridian and I'm always an organizer. Um, and I've been at State Innovation Exchange in this role, uh, working in across the country for two years now. Um, but before then I was policy director for racial and economic justice coalition in Florida working in the Florida legislature, um, advancing uh, policies around holding corporations accountable and also advancing race equity. And of course, facing countless different fights, but even in those fights, building power towards a long-term vision of the state that we want to build, right? Um, and also having some wins that you don't always hear about, but uh, absolutely able to stop corporate tax giveaways and stop some really harmful pieces of policy and also pass some really good things like diaper tax breaks for working families, for example. Um, and before I was leading a coalition and, and advocacy in Florida, I was legislative aide to Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith, who's now a, a senator-elect in the state. Uh, and in that role, every bill that we wrote was in collaboration with people impacted, right? And so to give some tangible examples of that, um, we put together a renter's bill of rights that was drawn up by direct experience of renters that lived in the district that experienced abusive landlord practices, right? Um, we had uh, students of, uh, who were undocumented who wrote a bill to get access to state-based scholarships, um, workers who wanted to organize for earned sick time in their local community, but it was preempted uh, by Disney in the state. Uh, and so every policy idea came directly from people that were impacted. And that's sort of one example of how we can build that collaborative governance um, and center people in policymaking where, you know, the lived experiences of, of folks is really where the expertise comes from. Y'all know what you need, right? Um, and so it's about building that collaboration with legislators who uh, are advocating for people. And I always say that when we're in state capitals, our opposition is trying to buy what we are building. But when we build together, it is so priceless um, and, and it cannot be bought and we're durable and we can focus on that long-term permanent uh, power that we want to build. Um, I think the last thing I'll note, and then I will um, hand it back to, to you, Brenda, is that the other piece of this is uh, my twin sister is also now a state house representative in Florida, Representative Anavi Eskimani, who is my legislator and my roommate. We rent a home together in Orlando. So this work about how we organize in collaboration with state legislators uh, is very, not just professional, very personal for me as well. Um, and again, that, that piece around imagining states where that machinery of government is actually working for us um, versus the special interests is the thing that really drives me every day. Um, and I'm very excited for this conversation and really grateful to be here. Mm. We are so lucky to have the three of you um, and building local power 
you know, that byline, that could be our byline too at ILSR. We have a podcast called uh, Building Local Power. So <laughs> check it out. Um, so, you know, let me, I just want to start because, Laura, you, you know, you emphasized the building relationships, and I think all of you did um, talk about that. And I just want to dive a little bit, you know, start building relationships. And I, I heard that from all of you. I mean, I might, you know, when you, when you, like, Nick, you sponsor, Californians Against Waste is sponsoring the bills, but then you have to find an author. So, and then how do you decide, I'm going to start with you, Nick, like, how do you decide what, you know, is it just your team at Californians Against Waste? Or do you have a coalition of advocates statewide that are telling you, hey, CAW, sponsor this bill? You know, and how do you, what's your relationship with your elected officials to get those authors? And how have you been so successful? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is a coalition. Like, we can't accomplish anything as a single entity. We we, we don't have a PAC. We don't have a million members, you know, we're a staff of, depending on whether we have a grant, you know, somewhere between six and eight people. Um, but our strength comes from organizing coalitions. And, you know, the, there are, I think what we have found to be most effective is actually finding coalitions that aren't obvious. It's not a coalition of 40 environmental organizations. It's, you know, looking for opportunities where there's a business a uh, private, private sector, public sector uh, advocacy coalition. So, you know, oftentimes a lot of the issues we work on are actually a major cost to local governments, for example. Um, and, you know, having local governments come in and say like, this is affecting your ratepayers because uh, manufacturers are making products that we have to then deal with and your ratepayers are paying for it is effective having uh, recyclers come in and say, we can create jobs by using this material that we're throwing away. Having you know farmers come in and say, we need more compost. Um, and so we really always try, try to have those broad coalitions. That's always been really um, kind of a key to our success. And then, you know, you mentioned the, how do we choose a legislator? And it is really hard. <laughs> Um, because that's really the sweet spot. Like, no matter what we do, it all comes down to the person whose name is on the bill and their staff. And and um, with uh, with complete and total respect to the delegate, it's sometimes the staff is the most important person. Because when you have a passion staff person who understands the issue, and you know does all the work for their boss, their boss can show up well prepared, you know, where the stakeholders are, et cetera. Um, I mean, that makes a really, really big difference. And then, you know, again, on the legislators too, I, we kind of take for granted, I think a, a naive mistake that a lot of advocates make when they first start working on legislation is they go to the legislator who's historically cared about this issue and kind of stop there. Um, and you know, sometimes the person who cares the most about your issue isn't necessarily the best advocate. Sometimes having an advocate who's coming from a different perspective, somebody who's coming from a labor perspective, talking about issues is, is valuable as opposed to just having an environmentalist. Um, or, uh, you know, sometimes there's just a legislator who is very well respected with their colleagues. And that carries so much weight. I think it's something we all forget to think about sometimes is how, how do the other how do the other senators or assembly members look at this person? Do they see them as somebody who proposes serious ideas, who works with stakeholders, or do they see them as somebody who's you know trying to get a press release and a headline and that's about it? Um, but really, it's so hard to predict, especially with new new members who come in. Um, you know, sometimes we think somebody will be amazing because they check a million different boxes and then it's a total disaster and other times like you know we don't necessarily expect somebody to be a, a champion on our issues but it turns out they're the best champion on our issues because they're an unlikely supporter um so it's a little bit of, of trial and error yeah i'm going to come back to the, the business point you made with businesses um as part of the coalition because i think that's important but Laura, i want to go to you about um some of the 
relationships, like how do you work with your constituents who come to you with bills? You know, you were a constituent at one point. I love that you ran for office because you could, yes, you can do it better. Uh, um, you know, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you decide what bills to sponsor? You have a full plate. I mean, you, you know, you're not one of those legislators that say, oh, I got one bill, you know, you're gonna push and you work so hard on all your bills. And, um, and then a little bit, I know each state is different and like Marilyn, you already mentioned is a very short session, but this, this idea of who do you pick, like in Maryland, sometimes, you know, it's helpful to have the sponsor be somebody who's on the committee who hears it first because it won't go to the floor unless it gets out of committee. And so maybe you could just talk a little bit about the process in Maryland and how that might actually relate to other states too. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think, um, and Nick, 100%, the staff makes us look good or bad if, if we don't have the right staff. I will say that depending on the state you're in, um, and I have a, a rock star uh, chief of staff and, and amazing legislative uh, folks during the session, depending on the state you're in, uh, you, you may have legislators with more or fewer staff. And, and so in a part-time in Maryland, I have one full-time staff year round. There's some states where there's no staff. Um, and that actually in those states, you know, six talks about like, let us be your legislative staff, which is, which is awesome. Right. And you can be, you know, I basically consider Brenda to be my compost expertise, legislative staff, right? Like if I see a bill come in, um, and I'm not sure what I think of it, I'll send it to her and be like, where, where should we be on this? So one of the roles really that folks can play, um, as you build those relationships, like I trust her and I trust her 100% to give me the full outline and there's not perfect policies, right? And so I know someone's gonna, like I'm, I need to understand these are the advantages and disadvantages of this approach. And if we could add this amendment in there, then it would be, um, you know, we could live with it. Uh, or we, no version of this, this straight up poison pill. There's no version of this we could live with. So like, let's do everything we can to kill it. Like that, that level of nuance and support and understanding, um, especially understanding because the bills come in, you know, with all their slickness sometimes looking like they're great, all the greenwashing that some of the bills come in with and really having people, you know, who we trust to kind of help us understand all the nuanced pieces of it. And so I think, you know, as folks on this call with a range of experience in this in this world are thinking about, you know, the relationship that you build with your legislators, um, you know, being able to build deeper relationships and more nuanced relationships that go beyond just that one bill, right? So, so to Nick's point about like, yeah, you're gonna have that relationship and strategically pick this person might be the surprise sponsor, but therefore very effective, or this person is the obvious sponsor and therefore very effective. Um, uh, like really thinking of it, the reason we keep saying relationships is that whether this person takes your bill or not, whether your bill passes or not, um, having that ongoing relationship because there is going to be a bill next, there's going to be, you know, we're going to see 3,000 bills next year and the year after and the year after, and you may have thoughts on some of those, even if they're not your number one priority. And so so building the 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 depth and the trust, I think, is sort of first and foremost the most important thing, separate from whether a person um, you know, sponsors the bill or not. And then I think you may become the de facto staff area of expertise, you know, for that person in whatever area you're focused, you're focused on. So healthy yeah. soils and compost waste management, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. No, no. I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. Feel free to though, because um, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. No. So the last thing I was just going to say about that is so so really thinking about your engagement, even if you're coming, you know, to me to ask me to sponsor a bill, when I say to you. Uh, you know, my plate's full for this year, I can't. And, you know, maybe I recommend other people who might sponsor the bill. Um, and sometimes I, the, last year I was the backup sponsor, <laughs> which was fine. We got someone else, um, not offended, um, was a better, in a better position. And, and so, so they took it and, and ran with it. Um, uh, but, but just that even if I'm not the sponsor this year, like continuing to build that relationship, because there may be something that we can do together next year, the year after, um, whether it's introducing a new bill, killing another bill, adding an amendment onto a bill or, or, you know, something else that we're not thinking of yet. Yeah. 
Um, and, and, and in that particular case, the sponsor we ended up with was the vice chair of the environment committee and Lorg wasn't on the committee. So we thought that would help. So hundred um, percent. Yeah. So it's all good. And it's being reintroduced this year. And, and, uh, and on that note, sometimes it can take more than one year for a piece of legislation to, to move forward and pass. And, you know, it gets updated and revised and compromised. And that's all built on those relationships, both with the people who are supporting those bills, as well as the opposition. Um, and so I want to, I, I want to come to you, but I want to come also come back to the business and the opposition. I'll come back to in a minute. But Ida, you mentioned peer to peer, like just the strategy, like sometimes you have a new bill and it's like, oh, that's, uh, we haven't done that in Maryland or in our state. I don't know if we can do it, but if you can show that's effective and the benefits in other states and they can hear from other legislators, I think that sounds like gold right there. So maybe if you could share a little bit more about how people could avail themselves of either sixes, um, you know, ability to do that, what would be the steps and the, if there's any particular bill, bills in the composting or food and ag system that you have examples of that, you know, you want to share just. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, and I want to uh, affirm the statements that were previously made to you by uh, my fellow panelists and uh, the legislators that are uh, passionate and like truly believe in the cause, even if they're not the sponsor can really be uh, helpful in sort of power mapping the policy, right? Like really, really key collaborators in understanding, okay, who is the most effective sponsor? What are the committees? What, where are the places we need constituents to come out and, and share their stories with certain key votes, right? Um, so we often suggest for folks uh, in, in organizing spaces, we often power map sort of, okay, here's, you know, here's our allies, here's what we need to get to. But when we ask folks like, have you power mapped with allied legislators? And they say, oh no, I haven't done that. Um, and so we really try to build that collaborative practice because, again, oftentimes the legislators are some of your best allies. Like if, if someone truly believes in your cause, uh, they are on the inside. They can get the intel for you. They're on the floor with their colleagues. They're building relationships with folks across the aisle. They can be some of your best champions to help advance your bill, even if they're not the sponsor. Um, so to the point that was made, there's a lot of different ways to organize and engage with legislators beyond a bill and beyond legislative session. Um, and that should be a year round relationship and and the the piece around how uh, our our ecosystem can be an extension of government is also really essential. Um, and when legislators come to us asking, um, hey, I want to do this bill on this and that. Um, what's another example in another state? The first question we ask is like, that's awesome. Are you connected with the advocates in your state about this policy? Because we also want to make sure that a well-intentioned um, uh, campaign is not, unintentionally taking away or uh, undermining a, an, an effort that's been going on for a while, maybe that's been grassroots led, but hasn't had the capacity to connect with legislators because maybe they don't have an in-house lobbyist, right? And so we also do a lot of that bridge building in states too, before we connect with another state, we first wanna make sure that this, the ecosystem in the state is aligned. And I'm sure you understand this, Brenda, as part of a national organization, a lot of national orgs are, are sort of historically known to sort of swoop in, helicopter into a state, right? And and uh, and sort of dismantle the work that's been happening in the state for a long time. And as mo most of the folks from in six, we come from state-based organizing and we've been there, right? And so that is not the model of our organizing that we believe in. So we always center the folks on the ground first and foremost, but then to your point, folks often will say, okay, well, uh, we're doing this campaign and yeah, we're, we're curious what happened in this state? What, you know, how did this state do it? Um, and yes, when it's very helpful when questions come up from the opposition, like this is impossible or this will cost too much or it's too difficult to be able to bring folks that are actually implementing it and saying um, like, no, yeah, we're doing it. And this is how we've done it. And we've brought in folks um, uh, to testify in different state legislatures in support of bills to show like this is how we implemented it and happy to answer questions um, from the committee about this process. Um, I'll, I'll speak on the, the recent uh, fights around uh, child labor. So we've had efforts to strengthen child labor protections as well as uh, combat the rollback of child labor protections, which of course is an agenda being pushed by a small group of billionaires and corporations to roll back these protections. Um, and so in that we had uh, folks in um, Iowa had had the fight already. And then the same bill popped up in Florida. 
And so we immediately connected Florida legislators and advocates with Iowa legislators and advocates so the Florida folks could ask questions, learn lessons, get their amendments, get their, you know, get get the 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 messaging, like understand, okay, what worked and what didn't work in your fight um, that we can, rather than starting from scratch, we have a foundation we can build off of, right? Um, and that's just like one of many examples of, of things that uh, we do at six in that sense. And then that led to a national publication around um, the uh, the rollback of child labor protections that includes ways to fight back and also to strengthen. Um, and in Florida, in that sense, the, the bill did pass, but it was uh, a lot of the harm was mitigated in it. Um, and that was through a lot of hard organizing and centering the stories of, of folks impacted and parents and small businesses and and all these folks that oppose that that proposal. Um, but in, in in addition to the resources from other states and lessons from other states helped for those legislators and advocates to have a, a base to start from, right? Um, so that's one example of sort of like in the agriculture space, because of course the, the rollback of child labor protections is very deeply connected to the ag industry um, and a lot of the multinational um, factory farms and CAFOs that are engaged in this uh, industry, uh, but happy to elaborate more with any other examples yeah. or pieces. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why we document model policies, local and state, is to help share that out to other groups. So uh, just want, you know, do check yeah. out our, our model library policy. And um, I want to talk about just, we found that it's also important to, over time, to, you know, if you have one year, we have a bill introduced, and then the people who are testifying against it are submitting oral or written testimony. The next year or the lead up to the next year, you have meetings with them to hear their issues. Not only is it part of this relationship building, but you some of those meetings, you can find out what the issues are and you're in a better position to address the issues either in making amendments to the bill or just in your narrative and storytelling. So I'm just wondering if, if any of you um, want to have any thoughts on kind of nipping in the bud the opposition or the strategy you know, does that pay into the play into the coalition? Do you bring them along or do you use that information in those meetings to sharpen your knives to fight them? Like Nick, like, and, and then I'll go around again. Yeah. Start with you, Nick. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a great question. I have an answer. I also have thoughts on some of the previous comments. I mean, this conversation go ahead. great. Um, but I, I think you, you said something that I really appreciate, which is find out what their issues are. Um, I think we tend to assume what people's concerns are with a bill. Or, um, you know, you just assume like, oh yeah, there's well, the garbage companies just want to throw away more stuff because they make money on landfills. Like, okay, like you could start there, but then you start actually talking to people and it's like, well, you know, our rate structures are written in a way, our franchise agreements are written in a way where it's hard for us to pass through costs if xyz happens but we're totally fine doing this if, if you do xyz um I, I just think there's so much value in actually talking to people and it's very rarely your initial assumption um is correct about why somebody has that position they might not even realize why they have that position um you know they might have their boilerplate talking point but once you start kind of delving deeper something else comes out and it could be an issue for the company that isn't obvious to you. It could be a relationship issue of like, you know, we work, oh, we always work with so-and-so and, and they don't like this. And so we just, we can't get there because of that reason. It could sometimes be the ego of the lobbyist. Um, you know, I, if an embarrassing number of times it comes down to a lobbyist who's kind of staked their reputation on killing something and they can't, risk their reputation by losing um especially in such an ego driven industry like lobbying and so then it's like okay well that's the problem i'm solving H how do i help this person not lose while still accomplishing what we want um yeah but yeah and 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 just what one more i mean there I had, there are a few comments that really resonated with me but one specifically that a uh, uh, delegate charcutian uh, said was that she trusts Brenda 100%. And I think that's the really most important part. We can't do any of this without trust. Um, you know, the, the, our most successful relationship with legislators are the ones that we built up over, over the years and they trust us. And so they know when we're 
ask him to do something that seems a little kooky, like that they're not going to look bad, right? That this is something that is researched and well supported, and there's a coalition of people who are going to agree with it. Um, and I always like when we hire new staff. My my first day, first speech is never lie, right? Like I'd rather lose any bill than than say something that's not true that will then hurt a relationship forever. Good advice. Um, yeah. Yeah. L uh, Laura, anyway. what, what, thank you, Nick. Laura, opposition. Oh my God. So many <laughs> thoughts. But, you know, it's funny. Let me start with never lie because I remember my first year as an innocent young babe. It was actually just six years ago. I wasn't that young, but, um, and I was like, just furious that, uh, people were at the, you know, witness table lying, you know? And I was like, so angry and so worked up. And I was like texting the chair of my committee. And he was like, yeah, well, I mean, that is what they do. And not, not, not like, not environmental groups. Um, because it was actually, a, um, trying to remember, I feel like it was fossil fuel companies, if I remember the specific hearing, but I was like, but that's not true. It's like, yeah, that's, that's what they do. And so, so it is, it's true. And, and so when you come in both advocating, but also acknowledging the nuance and acknowledging, you know, that there's not a perfect solution, but here's why we think this is the best approach given all the pieces, like that is the stuff that builds trust is the recognition and the dialogue about the nuance and the trade-offs and the challenges and, and all those kinds of things. So um, it is still devastating uh, how much lying happens, but I don't get quite as worked up as I used to. Um, but the, so the two other things that sort of came to mind um, that I hope are helpful in thinking about this. One of them is when we're thinking about like listening um, to the opposition and listening to what is capturing, like specifically paying attention to what is capturing the imagination of uh, my colleagues. And so when we had the organics waste ban that we worked on together, the specific thing that was capturing, and I'm just, I'd be interested, maybe this happens all over the, the country, but like the idea of rats and rats in alleys, because because I don't know if y'all knew this, but the rats were apparently waiting for us to source separate before they went in to eat the, eat the trash. So that's why they weren't going into the garbage. But once we source separate, that's why rats are gonna start being a problem. But this idea of, um, this kind of image that, that 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 the opposition managed to get of like rats and and so like just as the as the committee was discussing it like they're just so disgusted like somehow charcuterie and he was here with a bill that was going to promote rat infestations and so um but what ended up being most helpful was creating uh um uh, what do you call it, like flyers with uh, like handouts with photographs on them of what a source separated kind of compost, here's the garbage and here's the compost and here's the recycling, because it gave people another image, because what rats had done was put an image in people's head that was so disgusting, we had to have them sort of picture something else. And so as we were realizing how much traction the idea of rats was getting with folks, even though it was like really honestly totally irrelevant to what the bill was actually doing, it was just the specific concept of source separation. Um, and so once, once we got those pictures out, it gave people another visual to think about. And so I think, you know, I do a lot of work, like I like to super geek out about the policy and some like listening deeply, working on understanding what amendments could we bring? How could we change this so that it could really work for everybody involved? And that's really helpful. But sometimes it's like, whoa, like, oh, actually that narrative is creating an image that's really problematic. And how do we just just get another image in people's heads? And um, so uh, so just pictures of really neat and clean you know, three different buckets out in an alley, was <laughs> in a clean alley, <laughs> was what it was that was helpful in, in getting another image. The other thing, though, that I want to talk about in terms of coalition building is, um, and the example I'm going to give is in energy, but I think it's it's valuable. Um, you know, I do a lot of work on decarbonization, and I do a lot of work on, on clean energy. And the specific thing that I've worked really hard on is getting the building trades um, who have worked in the fossil fuel industry to, to, to engage in the coalitions with environmental groups and with industry and with ratepayer protectors and with environmental justice groups and folks doing grassroots organizing. 
um, on decarbonization and housing justice. And it's not, I mean, it is, when we talk about relationships, it is, um, you know, historically, um, unions representing the fossil fuel industry and environmental groups have not worked well together. And I think it's, it's starting to change and it's changing in some places, but it's a relationship that we have to continue to work on and we have to continue to work closely on. It's not as easy as just saying we're going to have good, clean jobs because there's so much more complicated than that. And that just pretending that that's the case without us being really thoughtful and writing PLAs and prevailing wage and unions into every single clean energy legislation that we write. Um, like just it's it's insulting when we just kind of say clean jobs are going to be great, right? So so really doing this work and the deep coalition building has been really important. But specifically, um, you know, the bill that I had last year that I was, you know, most excited about was the um, network geothermal bill, because one of the challenges, you know, when I work with IBW very closely and, you know, you can take similar skill sets that you use in one power plant and you can use them in offshore wind. Um, and it's a there's a training piece to it, but it's a it's a skill set that sort of transitions. But what about people who work on pipelines? Right. Like what about people who work on pipes? And so really um, most recently focused on network geothermal, working with a union that represents BG&E employees. Um, and and um, you know, with with without going into the details of the policy in network geothermal, it's it's a it's a utility owned uh, infrastructure that the same union would work on, and it's pipes in the ground, but it's bringing geothermal energy to a bunch of homes instead of br bringing gas energy to a bunch of homes. And still, it's not an easy like okay, well, since we're putting pipes in the ground, y'all are okay with that, right? I mean, still, there's the building of the relationships and the detailed work in the policy, but really thinking in a very detailed way about, um, especially workers, right? Like, I'm fine. I'm fine if gas companies go out of business, but what happens to their workers, right? And I'm also fine if gas companies stay in business if they want to do geothermal instead of gas, right? So. Um, I'll work with them either way, but what's going to happen to the workers and really kind of doing that deep organizing and connecting and and making sure that when we're creating the new kind of a future, recognizing that in 2024, most new industries that are developing in 2024 are not unionized industries because of the decades of anti-union work that that corporations have done. And so unless we're purposefully putting prevailing wage, healthcare benefits, retirement benefits into the bills for the new industries, whatever those new industries might be, um, we're likely to have industries that are exploitative if they're if 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 we don't kind of create them though. And so um the the I think the history of that and then building the relationships over time um to the point that I now have some of these um labor unions that I work with now reaching out directly on their bills to the interfaith power and light and the, the folks that kind of they got connected to through working on my bills and now they're connecting directly with each other on on other pieces and that's ultimately um that's ultimately how we're gonna kind of fight corporate power is uh is a, is across those those lines and so um it is just on the coalition buildings piece specifically you know and sometimes it takes several years and it takes starting with the the easier bill or the more narrow bill uh, to build those relationships and the trust and then to start doing the really hard work together um or, or, you know yeah. moving into the future and that that's that's a good um segue back into something i wanted to come back to which is kind of get bringing businesses into your coalitions and relationships as you're saying and to be clear at ILSR we're not anti business we're anti big concentrated corporate power, you know, whether it's Amazon or the big fossil fuel companies that you were referencing, Lorig, or in the case of waste, the big monopoly tr titans of trash, you know, which making still continue to make billions of dollars. So we want to see the solutions to trashing, you know, burning fossil fuels are often rooted in community or can be rooted in community renewable energy or community owned utilities and so forth. So it, it it has like with the bill you mentioned on uh, banning food waste uh, from disposal or targeting large food waste generators. You know we had the Maryland Restaurant Association that opposed that for the first few years, and then we had to compromise and say, okay, we're going to go after the big food waste generators. We won't target restaurants now, and we were able to remove that opposition in the bill passed. So, but also to bring the composters to the witness table. 
and uh, and meetings to say we need this legislation because it's good for business, it's good for jobs, and we can't grow our business if we don't have some of these policies in place. So I don't know. I'm going to go to you, Ida. Like in your work at six, are you working mostly with elected officials? Do you also how do you bring businesses to the table in your coalitions? Yeah, um, we work very deeply with uh, elected officials as well as uh, coalitions and partners and in, in, in many states, our state directors hold different coalition spaces. Um, and so it's a great question. And I think it, it to your point, uh, when it comes to challenging the concentration of corporate power um, in, in various industries, uh, you need those local businesses as key allies. And often you have a shared um, goal there. And I think uh, there is, to, to your point, there's a lot of power that we have to build in those pieces. I also think it goes back to power mapping a little bit. So for example, um, uh, in Florida, there was a big fight around net metering and it was uh, the monopoly utility company wanting to remove this way that folks can get affordable solar panels. And so in that fight, it was this coalition of the solar panel companies, right? Many of them pretty large uh, companies across the country, but it was a coalition of solar panel industry and environmentalists and uh, housing advocates all coming together trying to stop this bill, right? And ultimately they they won, they were able to defeat it. Um, and so I, I think it's about power mapping and also understanding those different, um, you know, allies that we need in these different pieces. Uh, but I do want to go back to that sense of trust and how essential that is. And, and, and to the point that was made um, by the delicate charcuterie and like oftentimes it is the it's not always the what it's the how so in that effort around decarbonization and, and a just transition you're not only working towards something you believe a policy you believe in but you're building those deep relationships that can then be used uh to in further efforts right um to advance like your further like long-term goals for the state and our opposition is always working to divide and conquer us and so the ways that we can stay um, united and aligned and build that trust. And when we do get into those tough places, because oftentimes we will be put into places of compromising and harm mitigation and figuring out like either something has to pass or nothing will pass. And like, how do we do that? That trust is so essential in those conversations because, again, there will always be efforts to divide and conquer. Um, I've worked in many, many different coalitions and helped create coalitions. And there's often dynamics where even uh, certain legislators or lobbyists might be telling different members of the coalition different things because they don't realize how close we talk and that we share. <laughs> so so they're betting on us not communicating to each other because they want to pit us against each other. Yeah, uh, And so just sharing that intel um, and strategizing is so is so essential. And in the, the these different pieces, um, bringing businesses in are so essential. And there are different small business like organizing infrastructures that are popping up, right? But it's really important to make that distinction. I think housing is a really good example, right? Where we have corporate landlords up against mom and pop landlords, right? And so there are a lot of opportunities to build allies, sometimes unlikely allies in these situations that are really essential to organizing. I think I'll say one last thing too, in relation to some of the previous conversation, organizing 101 is always you call in before you call out, right? Because to the point that was made by Nick, you don't always know what's what the actual issues are. We can't make assumptions. And uh, there is just so much um, power in that, in that building that trust and having that communication. Because the other piece is that, you know, we're all human and legislators are humans. And these bills are inherently complicated and nuanced and you're dealing with oftentimes front, you know, astroturf organizations that have really nice names and are saying the, the right things. And you as a legislator or as an advocate might not fully know even what, who is funding that organization, right? Um, and so having that trust to be able to, um, and, and, and calling folks in to just understand where they're coming from before calling out is a really foundational organizing tactic that's really important in this work in, in state legislators. And also, in addition to that, following the money and also following campaign finance and lobbying registrants and knowing how to do public records and having strong relationships with media, right? So you can also, when a reporter puts out a statement that doesn't make sense or is not factually accurate, you can also, or maybe it's just one perspective, you're able to, to reach out to them and say, hey, I saw this story and I appreciate this, but I was wondering, did you talk to anyone on this side of it, right? And so all of that boils down to relationships, right? Um, and so that is so essential when we're organizing in state capitals. Yeah, and the on the relationship piece, I'll just share that, like in Maryland, um, 
you know, we work closely with Clean Water Action as one of the statewide groups and they're a membership group. They have the lobbyists that are registered and they work on a bunch of issues, not just composting or waste, but coming in and working with a statewide group can also be a strategy for those of you who are interested. You're not the lobbyist or the statewide environmental group, but you could f form these relationships with those groups that are and get your issue before them and hopefully form these wider coalitions. But Nick, I wanna get you in on the businesses question. Like how, cause I feel like if you don't have businesses testifying in support of your bill, the legislature, you know, I just noticed in Maryland, they senators always straighten up when the business testifies or youth actually, you've got the youth vote. It's also like empowering, you know, youth to come, they stand, you know, sit up straight and listen, but the businesses, when I'm testifying, it's like, who's this woman, you know, besides you, Lorik, but anyway, Nick, just talk about like the importance of getting businesses to be part of your coalition to make the case that this environmental legislation is not anti-jobs and not anti-business. I, I, I think that is really, really important. I, I don't think we've really gotten anything controversial done ever without showing a business environmental coalition um, or, you know, an environmental labor coalition or, but just showing up as environmentalists alone, you can't get controversial stuff done. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, Sometimes it's finding a business who has a direct benefit. Like, you know, we're going to create recycling jobs. We're going to create composting jobs. Um, there's a very direct incentive there. But other times it's, you know, you might not have that opportunity. So it's about addressing someone's concerns and having them come up and say, the senator has been meeting with us for the past year and has addressed our concerns and we don't support this bill, but we are removing our opposition because we think we could implement it. And that can also carry a lot of weight. Um, and, you know, it's, but it, I 100% agree. And I mean, there are a million examples where we weren't able to get something done until industry came on board. Sometimes it's, it's frustrating because, you know, they should have been on board for a long time and, and it takes a while to get them there. Um, other times it's, you know, it goes all according to plan. And um, I mean, I, I could think of literally every issue I think we've ever worked on, this has applied, but just one issue that comes to mind is a uh, right to repair. We worked on right to repair legislation for five years in California. Um, the tech companies have a very big presence in California. Uh, they're mostly headquartered here. So it's, you know, it's our, one of our main state industries, right? So they have a lot of influence. Um, and the tech industry uh, fought the legislation through the years. And actually, we couldn't even get a hearing for our first couple of years. And then after that, we got hearings, but we basically would die after one committee hearing. Um, and ultimately, what got the bill over the top was a few different things. But one of the main things was that we got Apple to come on in support of the bill. And as soon as, and, and it's not like they just saw the light. There were a lot of advocates who were pushing them. There were newspaper articles criticizing them. Um, there was, you know, a lot that went into that. Um, but once Apple came on board, every other tech company said, oh, shoot, people are cutting a deal. We need to get in on this. And then it was like a speed run through the legislature after that. Nice. Yeah, yeah. so the importance of the media too. Ida, you referred to that. Nick just alluded to that. So we are going to get some questions in the chat now. I did want to, um, and and also panelists, if you keep your answer shorter, we'll get to more questions. So we're going to go to the half hour on the East Coast. That's 1.30 p.m. Um, and um, I wanted, you know, one question I'll just put out there, but let me, um, is just, maybe this gets to what we were just talking about with the pro business, you know, showing that you're creating jobs and it's good for business and the environment. But I was going to ask a question about, um, before we get to the chat questions is, how important is it controlling the narrative or framing the issue? Like, for instance, just to use an ag issue, Ida, you know, in Maryland, you know, we to do bills that are regenerative ag or organic farming, no go. But Healthy Soils Act passed because who's not for healthy soils? So the importance of, you know, what are the strategies or tips for controlling the narrative? and the language and messaging that we use in these bills. So I don't know, Laura, 
I'll just go to you first, then Ida, then Nick, just but briefly, and then we'll get to the questions in the chat. Yeah, can. no, I would I would ditto that. And that's where I think the relationships with the legislators who can say, and it's even different committee to committee, right? If you're trying to get a bill through this committee, um, there's certain personalities and things that they like or don't like, um, as opposed to that committee. And that's where having relationships with legislators and floating the conversation and floating the names of the, you know, the bills and the, you know, concepts behind them you can get the feedback um, and it changes too, right? You have the chair of the committee right now who will move this kind of bill, won't move that kind of bill. And now there's a new chair. And so you may, you might have a shot at that other language. And um, so I think that, that again, that building the relationships to have people who can tell you about the reactions they've seen from their colleagues is important. Yeah, Nick, I, any thoughts? Oh, Ida, go ahead. I won't go to Nick, I'll, just, I'll echo that and I'll, I'll just note that the uh, message discipline is so important in our work. And sometimes the policy people should not be the messengers, right? Because I know I like to get into the weeds. That's not always the best message. Um, and so uh, we have a frame. It's values, villains, vision, right? Because it's also really smart to name like a tangible villain. Usually it's corporate power, right? Uh, and generally across like all communities, rural and urban, suburban, like, uh, the struggle between people power and corporate power really resonates. And I think that's the other piece. A lot of these issues is to fight back against that rural and urban divide. Um, there, We have more in common than we have differences. And again, uh, really centering a tangible villain, whatever that core monopoly is, right, is often effective. But I really echo the delicate piece. It's hard because it's also case by case and like it does vary. So you also have to be tactical to, to adapt to your audience and all those pieces too. But that frame of values, villains, vision, generally speaking, is something that has, has worked and being having that message discipline to, to stick to it and repeat it over and over again. Yeah, know your why, right? Nick. That's great framing. Actually, I, I just wrote down the values, vision, villain thing and, and talk to myself about that. I love that. That's great. Um. You know, uh, another part of this is sometimes it really helps to have an easy to understand elevator pitch. Like, you know, I talk about how we almost never get things over industry opposition. The one time where that's, or the few times where that has happened, where there's still pretty big industry opposition, but we've gotten stuff done, is when the legislator can explain the problem in a really easy to understand way that resonates with other legislators and it kind of elevates the conversation above stakeholders, above lobbyists. Um, for example, you know, we had a bill uh, banning the use of the chasing arrow symbol on products that are not actually recyclable. And industry hated it. But our, our legislator was able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with every member of the legislature and they all got it because like, oh yeah, totally. I, you know, I, he would always tell the story about like, he gets his, his newspaper in a plastic bag and has a big chasing arrows on it. And he, he, even though he works on these issues all the time, he would put it in the recycling bin because that's the recycling symbol. And that just kind of resonates on a personal level. And it's an easy to understand elevator pitch. Um, similar right now we're working on expiration date reform and the terminology and industry hates it. But again, our legislature our legislator is able to have a normal human conversation with her colleagues and point out how confused everybody is about the terms on packaging and how everybody has a spouse or a child or a parent who throws stuff away at the wrong time, right? Um, and it just sort of like elevates the entire conversation above the, the where are the stakeholders on this issue? Yeah. Good, great point. All right, let, we're, let's see if we can do like quick responses. So Lorig, um, quick, you know, you have a question. How is it best for a group of people to communicate with their state, state legislators to share that group's legislative priorities? Email, phone calls, postcard, physical mail, any tips? I think if you can get in person, that's best. If you can do a phone call, that's next best, Zoom phone call. I think if you can't for whatever reason, you know, email, uh, social media, what have you, but always in person is is the best connection. Okay, great. Um, uh, Ida and Nick, do you have anything to add to that quickly or should I move to the next question? Okay. In, in person in the district during non-session times is, okay. is the time to build those relationships. Okay. Um, suggestions to over 
kind of talked a little bit about this, but I, I don't know, suggestions to overcome the power of corporate interest defeating environmental policy efforts. And so it, there was a little bit more in Connecticut, the state level, the environment has repeatedly been portrayed, often at the last moment of the session, year after year, and corporate interests have triumphed. And this is despite organizational innovations between environmental groups and bills introduced by our environmentally oriented legislators. Suggestions, that sounds like a cry for help from Connecticut. <laughs> Nick, I'll start with you. I mean, it feels that way. It, it definitely feels that way. But when you look at the big picture, we get a lot done and we, we all collectively move the needle. And it's just important to keep that in mind that, you know, most people don't run for elected office to do the bidding of corporations. They run for elected office because they want to see a positive change in the world. And, you know, for for all the, the $5,000 shoes out there, our groups, our nonprofits get more stuff done because we're right. And, and I think it's just important to keep that context in mind. Ida, anything? Yeah, I would I would add um, that the, the these things I also probably a lot of this work has happened right, but power mapping and with your allied legislators and partners and and try, trying to identify the gaps and also looking at maybe other states that are similar dynamics that have advanced things and so what are lessons there, but oftentimes we see pieces around okay these are the key leaders and like do we have membership in these districts maybe we don't or um you know do we need local electeds engaged do we need different businesses engaged is it the faith community like what what are the different voices that are missing from the table that can move the the people you need to advance a policy uh and so just having like that power map strategy and that long-term visioning and yeah giving yourself grace because it's also you might not win that year but we are in a long haul here and you are building power to advance change, maybe not that year, but how is it in that campaign, you're stronger at the end than when you started? So what are other like measurable ways to show that you are growing, whether that's new membership, new leaders, media hits, narrative shifts, like what does it look like, right? More legislators that are engaged in your work and and yeah, and that power mapping piece, and there might be some unlikely allies you haven't considered yet. Um, but again, these are probably things folks in the ground have considered, but I'm always happy to, to throw off ideas if it's helpful. Yeah, and I think the lobbyist and what they give to each legislator is public information. You can get that. So I don't know if sometimes that data can help if you can pull back the curtain. But um, all right, Lori, this one's for you. Could you share examples of some of the most effective grassroots efforts to advance legislation, you know, such as personally signed cards as opposed to an electronically signed petition for a bill? Um. Yeah, I mean, always showing up in person is is better. I mean, like I'll just say that we get I pro I probably get three thousand emails, um, five thousand emails in a session. It's a lot, and and I have my staff track like who is it. We respond to all the all the constituent emails we respond to. Not every legislator wow. does that during session, um, but when people show up in person, uh, when people, um, uh, you know make even the phone call, like even if you can't come in person, actually calling the office, it makes it, it just, it's different from, from the, you know, from, from the email. Um, I mean, I think that there's like, we had, you know, 9,000 um, postcards from young people the year that we got the money that Joe uh, is asking me how we can get some more of it. We're, we're continuing to work on it. Um, the the year we got that money was the year that that Joe and a bunch of students organized nine thousand postcards from students across the state of Maryland who like hand wrote like why composting is important to them. Um, now, uh, the, so and and like and so like this fifth graders, I mean the the five year olds with like the picture of the stick figure of them throwing the. I mean it was really, uh, it was really impressive. Uh, his point, if I could just answer another question, Brenda, that you didn't just ask me to answer. So the, 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 the postcards were pretty amazing and the students came themselves and we took them to meet with the Department of um, the Department of the Environment, uh, the Secretary of the Department of the Environment. Um, but then in implementation, and this gets probably a little bit beyond what we're talking about today, because today we're talking about legislation, but it is worth you know, paying attention to then once the money was was allocated, um, in the implementation, it was there were many challenges, and so as a result, the money didn't come out till very late in the school year, and and a bunch of other things happened. And so it is worth 
just kind of having in the advocacy toolkit and in thinking about what it is that needs to get done after the legislation is passed, you know, the agencies don't report directly to me. And so I put a lot of pressure on them, try to move things along, but it's important to have, um, you know, I do oversight, but I can't move, once I direct the money, I can't make it get out the door, right? And so I can push on it, but it is important to have a, a an implementation strategy, you know, when the regs are getting written, as well as a legislative strategy. I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, and Joe yeah. knows I'll keep working with him on getting that yeah. money. And, and what Laura's talking about, there was a bill in Maryland that uh, created a grant program to do food waste reduction, recycling, and recovery at schools, but then the funding got pulled. And so. Well, first it got released mm -hmm. late in the school year, and yeah. then the next year it didn't get funded. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, in relation to organizing and disseminating information, what are some strategies for sharing information to support a cause? How do you expand your co coalition partnerships? How do you ensure publications are impactful and get to the right people? Nick, I'm going to start with you and then go to Ida. So. Uh, actually, I, I think it's partially not being shy about using other organizations' work that they've put out because there are a lot of people in our movement who are putting together good things. And the specific example I was going to bring up at some point, and I'm shoehorning into this question because it seems appropriate, was, um, you know, we work a lot on composting and we had a hard time kind of telling the story. ILSR put together a series of really good infographics about why we should be composting. I emailed Brenda, I said, do you mind if I print these out for our legislature? And she's like, yeah, sure. And so we literally took the ILSR infographics, made them into a brochure and dropped one off to every single legislative office. Um, and I think there's like, it's just important to know, like other people might be better storytellers than you. And if they do tell the story effectively, you should share their story. We don't need to all try to reinvent the wheel every single time. Yes. And on that note, if you need us to produce stuff to help you tell the story, let us know. Maybe we can do it. You never know. Um, all right. Uh, Ida, do you have anything on on I really you know, love strategies. Yeah, sharing yeah, information. I really yeah. love that example. I'll I'll also share that at times your legislators can be further amplifying your message. So in things that can be created to also be sent out to constituent lists to do um, library office hours together, care canvases like door knock in the community in, and to recruit for an event, right? And how can grassroots organizations co-host these events with district offices to support each other and getting out more in the community and also educating around issues that you care about. So we help legislators do that across the country with partner organizations. Again, your relationship does not have to be just during legislative session. It can and should be year round. And there's a lot of really amazing partnership opportunities to uh, help people and get out in the community and and lift up civic engagement, but also organize folks around different causes that uh, that that matter to you. I think I'll also note that in similar to, kind of to the last question, but just as much as we hold folks accountable, it's really important to lift up folks in gratitude. If we just talk about why government is not working for us, we are also telling folks that, oh, so no, you shouldn't be engaged. Why bother? Everyone sucks, right? And we know that's not the case. The folks on this call are, are working together and advancing some really amazing things. Um, but just as much as we talk about the things that are wrong, we need to lift up and talk about the good that's happening to give folks hope and to uh, to lift up folks. And I'll give one quick example. Whenever we have a really hard vote and we lose the vote, we would still thank the folks who voted on our side, right? And we would center them and their heroism more so than the folks that we were opposing, right? Because again, it's, you want to lift up champions, A, to, to build that civic engagement to remind folks the government can work for you. And also folks want to be a hero. So it's like, oh, what side do I, am I going to be on? Am I a hero or am I a villain here? And so when you, you let folks decide by really lifting up your champions, that can also be more appealing sometimes than just uh, isolating folks uh, as opposition. So these are all tactics, right, that are up for folks to decide what makes sense in your campaign, but wanting to lift it up as well as an organizing tactic. Yeah. Can yeah, I mention Laura. one other thing? It's I it just came to mind while you were talking. It's a little bit, um, I think it's related, is um, legislators, especially off session, especially in the, you know, in the in the interim, love getting their taking their photos at things with children, with farmers, with right. So I yesterday I had a 
groundbreaking. I got to hold a shovel. Today I'm going to ribbon cutting. I'm going to hold that ribbon. But like I get invited to go like visit the elementary school and see the composting happen. I'm at the on farm composting that that's happening over, you know, with compost crew. And I'm, you know, the photo of me with the hard hat and the um, now I care about these things even separate from the photo. I hope you've picked up on that in the last hour and 20 minutes. But um, generally folks will respond to like, come visit this school doing this stuff. And so even people who may not be your champion, may not vote for your bill right now, um, may come and start learning from the students who are composting their schools, the food rescue effort that's feeding hungry people at this food bank that like, and so inviting to a specific thing so people can have that image, see what food rescue looks like in terms of people being fed good food, good food that was about to be thrown out. People's idea of food rescue is like, okay, that's gross stuff. Why would it be handing it out? Um, seeing that and getting their photo taken there, they can use on social media or you can use it to thank them. That um, is a way to connect at the, you know, even when the, uh, even with a legislator who has a ways to go before they're going to be fully buying into the policies that you're pushing, they can see and appreciate one manifestation of that policy and celebrate that. And that can be the beginning of the, of the relationship. And if I can add really quickly to that, that experience is something that a legislator will remember when they're in the Capitol, right? Uh, so that's something that they can't take with them when, when they're in the legislature. And so often state lawmakers are just sort of in this building, right? And that you're isolated and that's all you know, and everyone's coming at you with stuff. And so those moments you can take folks out of that building into the real world uh, and ground folks in that and build those relationships and pour into them in that way, they hold that with them. And at six, we do a lot of cross-state convenings. Our agriculture and food systems team recently did a coastal convening, bringing legislators from across the country to meet with tribal communities, local fisheries, and learn about how they're facing corporate power in their communities. And they're going to take that lessons with them in their state capitals across the country, right? And so we do a lot of those kind of convenings because to the point that was made by the delegate, there's so much power in just getting legislators out of the building into community. Um, and that is up to us to invite them and to organize them and bring them into those places. Yeah, spot on. Um, since we have five minutes left, I'm going to just add, and I'm sorry, attendees, we didn't get to all the questions. They were so excellent. Thank you for participating. Um, just going to uh, go around, Ida, Laura, Nick, we'll just go in that order. But just closing, is there anything that you want to say that you haven't said already or an overall strategic consideration that you'd like to emphasize um, or, you know, something like recommended resources and strategies for folks with limited time and capacity, anything along those lines, closing, anything closing. So, um, uh, Ida. I'll keep it super brief, uh, but definitely if there's an issue you care about, there's likely a, a community organization that's doing that work. So uh, get plugged in and no matter what capacity you have, it's valuable. So whether it's letter writing, phone call, uh, being in the Capitol, it matters. And also just remember the power in our allied legislators. Um, there is so much we can build together with elected officials when we are fighting on the same side together and building that that power that, that centers people over profits in our state capital. So whatever way it is, get engaged and we're happy to help if we can. Great. Lorig? Oh, gosh, it's been great uh, kind of talking about all of this. And I, I think I would just end by saying um, you know, there's a little bit of, of conversation earlier about the challenges and sometimes feeling disheartened and just remembering that we're part of a, of a movement um, that is, it's a long-term movement and we have benefited from those who came before us and those who come after us benefit from us. And that doesn't mean there's not a great deal of urgency because there absolutely is urgency as we face the climate crisis and all of the other injustices. But, you know, we fight, we fight like hell around the stuff that's in front of us right now, but also recognize that there's things we're doing today that make the fight easier for folks in the future. So even if we don't see it today, we sort of keep the faith because of that. Um, and we and and we and we keep the faith because of our gratitude for the folks who fought before us. Nick. Um, I, I just maybe as a final thought, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are a lot of folks who are part of our movement who are working in the same direction and we're stronger together. And um, you know, a lot of that has to occasionally be humility. Like, you know, sometimes um, maybe we just realize like the politics will not line up in California to do X, Y, Z, and we really need Maryland to take this on, right? Or using content created by another organization or, um, and just in general, I, I think 
we have so many passionate advocates who work on these issues who have found winning strategies all over the country, all over the world. And we're a lot stronger when we coordinate, when we uh, lift up each other, and when we use each other as resources. Here, here. So as I said at the beginning of this webinar, you know, the hallmark of any healthy democracy is an engaged citizenry. So I hope you will get engaged at whatever level and capacity you can. Um, as Laura, I think, invited at the beginning too, to consider running for office. <laughs> you too can can uh, just be in government and be a decision maker and policy maker. And, um, and get engaged, check out our policy resources, six resources, California's Against Weight resources. We are sharing information across state lines. And um, thank you for joining to the end. There will be a quick survey that pops up um, as you log off. Please take it. That helps us improve our programming and help us see if we're meeting our equity and diversity goals. So there's some optional questions there. Appreciate. Um, um, and thank you, Ida, Laura, Nick, for participating. This was an excellent conversation. So um, and good luck in all the sessions that are coming up and all the work you're doing. And good luck to everybody who joined today. So have a good rest of your week, people, and a good fall. And with that, we will conclude the webinar. <laughs>